Hello. Welcome to the uh, January slash uh, February uh, meeting of the DNA Interest Group, uh, Iowa City. Uh, so we were unfortunate and needed to cancel uh, the January meeting. Uh, and so we um, are, uh, this February meeting will be our, our first meeting of, of 2019. So I see some familiar faces uh, that have been to our previous meetings. Um, the expectation is that we'll uh, meet throughout 2019 uh, at the Iowa City Public Library. And so our schedule is uh, that we do the, the fourth Tuesday of each month and at six o'clock here in the Iowa City Public Library. Um, next meeting will actually be in the uh, second floor uh, media room, a media lab. Uh, instead of in room A, uh, there's a, a larger event booked for that uh, day here in this room, so we won't be able, be able to meet there. And speaking of uh, our March meeting, uh, which will also be March 26th, uh, that particular meeting, the focus will be on uh, the ethics of genetic modification, and so dealing with uh, recent news of genetically modified babies. Uh, and then for our April meeting, uh, the plan is to do a program on uh, uh, privacy and forensic DNA searches, uh, sort of a follow-up from a meeting we had uh, last year uh, on that topic. And uh, this spring, so today in uh, March and April, uh, we're gonna have students from the Personal Genome Learning Center at the University of Iowa that will be developing those programs and offering those programs in the spring. And the idea, if you're new, this is your first meeting of the DNA interest group that you've been to, um, is to do topics uh, of interest in genetics and DNA-related sort of around issues uh, connected to uh, the market of DNA tests, such as Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, uh, and those types of DNA services. Uh, that's our general goal. If you're not on the email list and you would like to be on the email list, uh, I have a sign-up form over here to get on the email list. We also have a Facebook page uh, and other ways to, to learn what the topics are going to be for each one of our meetings. So with that um, and sort of bookkeeping issues, uh, I'll move on to tonight's program. And so uh, this uh, program tonight is going to be on the introduction to epigenetics. And so uh, to go through this interesting topic uh, sort of beyond DNA. Uh, and uh, we have uh, three students from the Personal Genome Learning Center at the university. Uh, They're going to be delivering this program. And so John and Tyler Adagosley and also Lauren Rao is going to, they're going to be uh, presenting tonight's program. So thanks for coming and I'll turn it over to Tyler. All right, so let's start at the beginning. So we all began life as a single, uh, a single cell, a zygote fertilized by the DNA of our mother and our father. And over time, this single cell has divided so many different times that an adult human body contains more than 30 trillion uh, cells. And out of these, uh, okay, I think I'm one slide ahead. Okay, never mind, I switched them up. <laughs> all right, so and out of all of these different cells, there's more than 200 different cell types. And these, all of these different types of cells are, can, uh, can differ a lot. For example, a, a neuron in a muscle cell, a neuron controls um, chemical messages in our brain. A muscle cell can uh, contract our muscles. How is it that uh, two, two, two cells, um, which originate from the same cell, can have uh, activities and functions which are so different? And that's one question which we will answer today. Yeah, uh, I was gonna talk about this slide first, but uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, likewise, a caterpillar and a butterfly. Uh, the, a caterpillar and a butterfly, as, as you all may know, is the same organism, just at two different points in their lifetime. So how is it that the same organism can look so different at two different points in its lifetime? That's another question we'll answer in today's talk. Identical twins. How many of you know a pair of identical twins? How many of you have mistaked one identical twin for another identical twin? Yep. We've all done it, and it's a common mistake, but it's not too surprising because identical twins are essentially clones of each other. They both originate from the same uh, zygote, which uh, created two separate human beings. So identical twins are genetically identical, and that explains why 
uh, they seem so similar, even identical. But another aspect about identical twins is that as they age, they tend to differ. They tend to look a little bit different. Both from a health perspective, one might obtain a certain disease that the other does not, uh, as in these two cases here, uh, as in the top two cases, and from a physical perspective. One may uh, have a different physical appearance than another, one may weigh more than another. So how is it that two human beings with the exact same genetic code who came from the exact same zygote can look so different over time? That is another question we will answer in today's discussion. So to start answering these questions, I think we need to have a basic understanding of genetics first. Now, the fundamental molecule in genetics is known as DNA. And DNA is probably the most recognized molecule in all of biology. But from a basic uh, understanding, DNA is not a very complex molecule. DNA is just this really long molecule with a chain of, a le of four letters, A, C's, T's, and G's, uh, in a specific sequence. And, uh, and it's packaged into almost all of our trillion, 30 trillion or so cells as 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, hence the name, oh, went back. <laughs> figuring out this thing, okay. As 23 pairs of chromosomes, 23, 23 chromosomes from our father and 23 chromosomes from our mother. So uh, DNA is also known as our genetic code or the DNA in our cells is also known as our, as our genome because uh, it contains, our, it carries our genes. So a section of DNA is, is referred to as a gene. And a gene, uh, based on that sequence of, of uh, letters inside of its uh, section of DNA, inside of the gene, it codes for a specific protein. So machinery in the cell can read uh, the DNA at the place where the gene is, and it can make a protein. And proteins make us who we are. They're involved in every metab metabolic reaction, uh, storage, structure. Proteins are what make up our hair. Proteins are who we are. So you can imagine if proteins are dependent on the sequence of letters in a gene, then if somehow you alter the sequence of letters in a gene or in our DNA, then protein will be created. And thus that leads to our different traits and di different physical features and different attributes. And uh, just as a note, one of these changes to as a single nucleotide polymorphism. And in this uh, group, as Dr. McAllister noted, uh, we like to help you guys with some, understand some of these uh, DNA testing kits. And one of them we talk about often, and we would be happy to talk to you guys about, is uh, 23andMe, uh, which looks at these SNPs, these single nucleotide polymorphisms in our DNA, and it can make uh, predictions about our ancestry, our features, our health, and et cetera. Now, later on in this presentation, we will also talk about a similar kit, an epigenetic kit, which can present your bio, which can predict your biological age by not by looking at SNPs, but looking at epigenetic features. And we'll discuss epigenetic features in a bit. So this is genetic genetics. And genetics can explain a lot of variations uh, across human beings, across cells, uh, across life. But there's a problem with genetics when we try to explain these uh, situations I mentioned earlier, because genetics tries to explain uh, variation, variation by looking at the differences in the sequence of, uh, of DNA inside of the gene. But in these situations here, uh, they all have the same DNA, the same sequence of DNA. So you can't explain these situations using only genetics. For example, cells, all of our cells ultimately come from that single zygote fertilized by, our, by the DNA of our mother and the DNA of, of our father. And, they also, and ultimately, they also come from these uh, stem cells and then they differentiate into all of these different types of cells, but they all have the same, uh, same DNA. So you can't use genetics to really explain, explain that. You need to have something beyond genetics to explain that. A caterpillar and a butterfly, it's the exact same organism, two different points in, in its lifetime. So it has the exact same DNA, just at two different points in its lifetime. So how, how can you, uh, so you can't uh, explain the difference with the, uh, appearance of a caterpillar and a butterfly just by looking at the sequence of DNA, which is what genetics does. And likewise, with an identical twin, as I stated before, they come from the fission of a single zygote, so that they're genetically identical. So their differences also cannot be explained solely through genetics. But perhaps uh, some of you might be thinking, well, if genetics can't explain this, then maybe we can use physio have explained these uh, different ident identical twins through physiological uh, factors, such as the, the one twin might weigh more than another because of the, their microbiome in their gut, or because of their, their environment or their lifestyle over time. 
And that may be, but I think the, the best example to the, the best example to explain uh, physical variation caused by environments and lifestyle can be observed in, in these two photographs here. So these photographs were taken of students at the Connecticut State Agric Agricultural College 80 years apart. One was taken in 1914 and one was taken in 1997. And uh, the, what these photographs show, if you look at the men only who are uh, dressed in uh, black in both of these photos, you can see that in 1914, the average height for the men was five, five foot eight inches, about five foot 10 inches. So how is it that the average height in these 80 years uh, shifted from, shifted about two inches uh, upward? Well, uh, you could argue that genetics has a factor in it and genetics does have a factor in height, but you can't necessarily assume that there's been a huge difference in the gene pool over these eight decades. However, one thing that we do know is that poor nu nutrition is strongly correlated with a lower height. And you can assume that uh, within these 80 years, or one thing we know is that nutrition has gotten better uh, over these eight decades from 1914 to 19 1997. So from that, you can assume that the better nutrition uh, over these decades has led to an, an increase in the average uh, height of our populations. But then the question is, how is it exactly that the changes in nutrition over these years leads to these uh, phenotypic uh, variations. And perhaps uh, you can explain that by saying that the environmental changes and these different factors, they cause these variations in our, in our features by, by working with our genes, by turning some genes on and turning some genes off. And with that, I introduced you guys the topic of epigenetics. So tonight we're gonna discuss epigenetics and I will start tonight's discussion with a better overview of exactly what is epigenetic, epigenetics, some, some more examples of epigenetics, or I'll explain, I'll explain the mechanisms of epigenetics. And Lauren and John, uh, our next pres presenters, are going to, uh, with having, using these mechanisms, they're gonna describe how these mechanisms of epigenetics are involved in disease and inheritance. And that will be Lauren's section tonight, a uh, very uh, fascinating section. And uh, John will discuss epigenetics and experimental biology, another uh, interesting, very new section um, in epigenetics. And we'll end tonight's discussion with, uh, with epigenetics and aging. All of these are, uh, I hope you will find that all of these are very fascinating um, aspects of what we know as epigenetics. So epigenetics, epi uh, is just a Greek root, which means like over or around. And I think epige epigenetics is a perfect name for this subject. Because what happens in epigenetics is that the sequence of DNA is not changed. Uh, those mutations, but what happens is there's these tags that stick to our DNA and turn off some genes. So for example, some of these tags might be methyl groups, uh, these things called RNAs, microRNAs, um, some proteins, and I'll talk about all this in a few slides, but some proteins called histones, which the DNA is wrapped around, those can be modified. So then these lead to the uh, switching on and off of our genes and ultimately to a change in our physical features, our traits, our attributes. So epigenetics is a change in phenotype, physical features without a change in genotype, the sequence of DNA. And these, these, all these tags, the, like the DNA methyl groups, the microRNAs, they stick onto the DNA due to uh, various factors, environmental factors, such as how you live your life, your nutrition, your diseases, your age, and so on. All right. So now knowing this, that epigenetics is caused by uh, things that stick onto the DNA and turn your genes off and on, we can explain these different situations that I start, started off today's presentation with. So yes, all of the different cells in our body ultimately originate from the same genetic, uh, genetic information, from the same zygote, and from uh, stem cells. However, even though all these cells have the same DNA, they don't have the same genes switched on or off. There's epigenetic modifications that occur during cell differentiation that cause one cell to become another. So the intestinal cells might have certain genes on that, that blood cells or neurons might not have turned on. Uh, likewise with the caterpillar, and I found, uh, this is a nice uh, picture I found online, it explains that epigenetic modifications over the life, lifetime of the caterpillar or the butterfly uh, can, can so drastically change its appearance and, and its function uh, so yes, that caterpillar and that butterfly are the same organism. They have the exact same DNA, but some parts of the DNA are, are turned on, some parts of the DNA are turned off in both organisms. Uh, in the case of height, height has both an epigenetic and a genetic factor. 
So yes, height is influenced about 80% from uh, our parents' height, but then 20% is influenced by epigenetics. And uh, as I stated before, uh, epigenetics, and as uh, Lauren and John will discuss uh, also, the, those epigenetic modifications happen because of our environment, our nutrition, our lifestyle. So uh, nutrition and sleep can turn on certain genes activated uh, that are associated with height, and that can lead to a, a greater height. And likewise with, uh, with twins, uh, it's, a, it's the same situation. Their, their diet or their lifestyle uh, part of the reason why they might seem different uh, weight-wise is because uh, their diet or their lifestyle can cause epigenetic modifications that turn on or off certain genes. And the, in the case of twins, um, you can really, epi tw identical twins are great for epigenetic studies because you can look at the DNA of identical twins, which remains identical throughout their lifetime, but you can look at the tags on top of the DNA to uh, look at the epigenetic features. So in this uh, uh, photo here, uh, the sections in yellow, the, the tags I talked about earlier, these uh, like the, the stuff that sticks onto the DNA, and areas where they're yellow, they have the same, same tags on their DNA. And areas which are colored, uh, green and red, the, the tags differ. There's different tags stuck onto the DNA. So you can see that when uh, identical twins are three, year, three years old, uh, both the structure of their, their DNA and the tags on top of their DNA is mostly identical. And you can see that because of the yellow region. Uh, however, you can see that some of the regions on these two chromosomes at three years old is not, is not uh, yellow. It's red, which means that the tags on the DNA are different. And that's what's caused by minor changes, such as one twin is in one place in the placenta in the, in the, in the womb, and, or one twin might be, might be cuddled more than the other. And, he's, and you can understand that these minor changes can uh, change their, their gene expression and the epigenetics of, of their chromosomes. And uh, you, you know, later on in the presentation, uh, John is going to discuss in vitro fertilization. And one thing they do in in vitro fertilization is they, they like to coat the, the embryo or, or the, the zygote in, in fluid from the, from the am, amniotic sac or amniotic fluid uh, because they want to replicate the, the environment of the womb. Uh, so, so, you know, there's not such a huge change in epigenetic factors. But the point here is that at 50 years old, you can see that the, the marks on the DNA of the twins is almost completely different because they've had different experiences, different, different uh, lifestyles uh, to, to some extent. So, so then you have these different epigenetic marks which can explain uh, different uh, features in the twins such as maybe one has a disease, maybe one uh, looks kind of different and so on. All right. So as I said before, ep, uh, identical twins are great for epigenetic studies. So this is an epigenetic study linking identical twins with IQ. So you can see that when identical twins are reared together in the same family, their IQ is correlated 85%. Now, the fact that their IQ is correlated 85% is good to note because you can see that, that IQ is not completely related to genetics or epigenetics. There's other factors that play a role in intelligence. Now, that being said, uh, when identical twins are reared together, their IQ is correlated 85%. Now, when identical twins are reared apart, their IQ is less correlated, which means that perhaps epigenetic modifications uh, due to their uh, different environments and lifestyles uh, cause, cause different um, genes to be turned on in relation to IQ. All right, so what exactly is epigenetics? Oh yeah, so I talked about this already. It's basically these things stick onto the DNA and they turn genes off and on. But now what we want to know is how exactly do the genes get turned off or on, all right? And to understand that, we need to understand DNA, which, uh, which uh, holds the genes, right? So DNA is this really long molecule. It's about two meters long. And, all of, and we have about 30 trillion cells in our body. And almost all of these cells have uh, DNA. And they have to stick the DNA into this really small region of their cells, which is only six, six micrometers long, 0. 0.00006 meters long. So how does this long two meter molecule gets, get packed, packaged into the, into the cell in such a small area? Well, how that happens is the DNA is wrapped around these proteins called histones, and then these histones form these chromatin fibers, which ultimately form our 23 chromosomes. All right, so, but what, the thing to note here is that in some regions, the DNA is more tightly packed, tightly wound up in these, uh, in these, uh, around these histone proteins, and in some regions, the, the DNA is not as tightly, tightly uh, wound up. So in the regions that the DNA is more tightly uh, wrapped up, uh, that's the black regions here. 
uh, the, the information, the genetic information cannot be read. All right, so, and then in the latter regions, the, the DNA is more open, it's not wrapped as tightly in the cell, so that genetic information is open to access. Now, uh, a little bit of terminology, the darker region is referred to as heterochromatin and the lighter region is referred to as euchromatin. All right, so what these epigenetic modifications do is when these, uh, when, when these uh, factors, these, these tags stick onto, their, onto our DNA, they switch the conformation of the DNA in that area from dark to, to light. I mean, from light to dark. So it essentially turns off the gene uh, in, the case of, in the case of methylation, for example. And then uh, later on in the presentation, I, I mentioned heterochromatin as a dark region. Uh, there's another dark region referred to as a bar body, and that's an inactivated X chromosome. For males, one of their X chromosomes are inactivated, and uh, another one of our presenters, John, will uh, talk about that later on in the presentation. Another very interesting, uh, interesting mechanism. All right. So, so, so yeah, we understand that, yeah, okay. So the, the tags that stick onto the DNA, uh, one of the tags we're gonna talk about a lot in this presentation is a, is a methyl group. Now, uh, a methyl group, you don't really have to know what it is, you just have to know that a methyl group is this thing that sticks onto the DNA where the sequence is a C paired with a G. So, so they refer to these areas where the methyl groups are stuck as CG islands. And we're going to mention this term methylation a lot because it is one of those tags that turn the genes off and on. And, it's, and in a lot of diseases, um, which Lauren will talk about. In a lot of these diseases, um, more methylation or less methylation can be indicative of cancers or obesity or psychological diseases and so on. Uh, later on in the presentation, John will talk about this epigenetic clock, which I also referenced earlier. There's 353 sites with methyl groups stuck onto the DNA like that. And there's this guy who uh, invented this, uh, this, this method where you can look at those 353 sites and you can predict your biological age. Uh, fascinating stuff. Um, also, but something to note is that the methyl groups are not the only thing that uh, sticks onto, the, onto our DNA. Another thing that sticks onto our DNA and can change uh, genes off and on are these microRNAs. Uh, John will mention this microRNA called EXIST, um, which can turn off our chromosomes. So, you know, in males, uh, one of our X chromosomes is turned off. Now, something to note, an interesting uh, thing to note about this is that, our, is that we believe that these epigenetic marks, when we have offspring, they're removed. So the epigenetic marks that we gather throughout our lifestyle, lifetime, throughout our experiences, they're removed uh, when we have offspring, when we have, uh, they're removed from the zygote. But uh, Lauren will discuss whether or not that's uh, certainly the case. So yeah, now I'll hand, hand it over to our other speaker, Lauren, as she discusses epigenetic diseases and inheritance. Um, can you hear me now? Better? Can you hear me? Hello? It's on. It's on. It just wasn't on when you first started, got up there. It's okay. On now, okay. But just speak up. Okay. Will do. Um, so epigenetic inheritance is the idea that what one of your past ancestors did can transfer down to you now, or that what you're doing now can be passed on to your future offspring. And so like the right picture shows um, what a grandmother could be doing, such as smoking, could in turn affect her granddaughter and she could have some other disease based on that smoking. Um, but this is usually um, not always the case. Uh, your biology tries to not have this happen. And this is through the mechanism of reprogramming that the left picture shows that you start as an egg and a sperm and uh, those two cells have a lot of these epigenetic marks on them so that they can do their function and they can be an egg and a sperm. But then once they come together and it, the egg gets fertilized, then they go through reprogramming where they, the cell gets rid of all, tries to get rid of all the epigenetic marks so that it can develop into all those different type of cells that you heard about earlier. And then, uh, so it keeps going with that. And as the embryo then develops, then it gets its own epigenetic marks on it. 
But it's thought that about 1% of those marks are actually missed during this reprogramming, and those are those 1% are what we would consider epigenetic inheritance. And an example of this is gestational diabetes. They, the diabetes is basically where the woman develops diabetes only during pregnancy, and during that, her baby is surrounded by an excess amount of glucose, and it's thought that that glucose might be what turns turns the epigenetics against her and so when she get if that child was a was a female herself then when she gets pregnant herself she is more likely to develop gestational diabetes as well actually um, but this isn't always what happens with gestational diabetes they have found some SNPs that go with it but the SNPs don't cover everything and so Epigenetics, they think, does play a role in it, but it's not quite yet conclusive on that. And then where epigenetics can also be seen in development is with genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting is basically where um, you have certain genes, like, like every other gene, you get one from your mom and one from your dad. But with these imprinted genes, you, one of the genes gets turned on and one of them gets turned off through epigenetics the methyl groups go on and they turn that one off. And these genes are required for the normal development. Um, if you have two that can turn on or none that are turned on, then you have, you can develop syndromes and other things wrong. And so an example of this is with lions and tigers. They are close enough in species that they can make viable offspring. And so they make a tigon or a liger based on which is um, male and which is female. But they look a lot different. Even though they're both 50% lion, 50% tiger, they look a lot different. And it's just based on which, which gene is turned on for them and which gene is turned off with this epigenetic mark. And so they look a lot different. And if lions and tigers are a little too like far out there for you to know, um, an example a lot more people know are like mules and hineys, and they have the same concept that depending on if the donkey or the horse is male or female, then it just depends on what they look like. They look a lot different based on which is the parent. And uh, genomic imprinting also has effects, like I said, on the birth defects and other things like that. And that can be seen in when you try and clone an animal. Um, birth, birth defects such as lar large offspring syndrome are common. And um, this is all, has a lot to do with wishing, with just being able to imprint a gene when you only are trying to make one clone from one parent. You don't have two that one can determine. One can be on and one can be off. So it's hard to get the epigenetics just right. And then it's also hard when you don't have an egg and a sperm, you just have a cell that you're trying to clone, then it's hard to actually go through that reprogramming process and make sure that you have all the epigenetics off before so that you can develop the whole organism. And Dolly, I just put Dolly the sheep up there. She was the first mammal cloned from adult cells and so they were able to get her epigenetics just right so that she could develop and she lived basically a normal life. She died a little earlier than average, but otherwise she was normal. They got her right. And so now I'm going to go into diseases that have uh, epigenetic effects on them. And so cancer is one. And hypermethylation has been associated with cancer where there's too many methyl groups on your DNA. Um, and these usually happen at tumor suppressor genes. So these genes are supposed to keep your cells in line and make sure that they don't form tumors. But if they get these methyl tags on them, then they get turned off so you don't have that protection. But then within an actual tumor cell, it's been found that there's hypomethylation where there's not enough regulation from these tags. And so there's just that difference of epigenetics and how that plays a role. And so one of the genes that has been associated with cancer is the P16 gene. It is involved in 
regulating your cell divisions. And so uncontrolled cell division is what leads to cancers and what tumors are. And so they wanted to look at this gene to see how it would be affected by epigenetic changes. And so an experiment from Baylor University in 2014 looked at it and they took this gene and they inserted another like genetic piece into it, another set of DNA into it. Then, and this piece would induce the P16 to have more methyl groups on it. It would be um, hypermethylated at that point, and they wanted to see if that would cause the cancer or not. And the results were that if they received two copies, then it was 27% that grew tumors. If they had just one, then it was 5%, and the controls that got no none um, had 0% tumor growth. And this just shows that there was an increased risk when you had a hypermethylated P60 gene, gene that you would grow cancer. And so this isn't conclusive, like if you have hypermethylation here, you're not for sure getting cancer. It wasn't 100%. There's a lot of other factors, but it shows that it'll be an increased risk. But it's, and then um, scientists thought that if they could induce a greater chance at cancer, if they could induce these tumors, could they also reverse that um, using treatments? And, and so they actually found that they could, and a couple treatments right now are, have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration as cancer treatment to reverse your epigenetics and hopefully help your cancer. And so now a psychological disorder, major depressive disorder, or MDD. And MDD has been found to be a combination of both your genetics and your environment. About one third is genetics and two thirds is your environment, they think. And so um, your environment can, when it includes a lot of high stress, especially during large periods of growth, like when you're in the womb or you're a baby or during puberty, those are big changes and can be really affected by epigenetic changes. And so when you have high stress, especially in childhood, then it will increase your, your risk for MDD, such as on the left picture, it shows that with more stimulus, more trauma events, then you increase your epigenetic marks and then it can lead to an elevated risk of MDD too. And so a couple genes I'm gonna talk about also that they've studied have an effect on your risk for MDD. And so the first gene is BDNF, and it's a gene that is involved in the creation and survival of nerves. And so um, being a psychological disorder, MDD focuses on your brain and your nerves being just right. And hypermethylation at this spot has actually shown to increase your risk of MDD too. Um, but they have to look at suicide victim victims because they have to study the brain and so you can't see the brain on a living person with MDD. And so it's not for sure, they don't know for sure if you have hypermethylation because, um, because of MDD or if the hypermethylation actually caused MDD. They don't know the causation versus correlation type of thing quite yet. And so then the other gene that they've looked at, looked at is the CL SLC6A4 gene, and this gene is involved in serotonin transporting, which is one of the neurochemicals in your brain that keeps it going too. And so um, just like BDNF, hypermethylation has been associated with um, increasing your risk, at, risk of MDD. And they, um, in a Duke University study in 2016, they actually connected poverty to hypermethylation at this point. And so they said the study took um, a group of kids that, <clears throat> a group of kids that had grown up in poverty and a group of kids that grew up wealth in a wealthy family. And they compared the epigenetic marks between the two. And overall they found that the kids that grew up in poverty had a lot more methylation sites at this gene and they had a higher risk of developing MDD. And that's 
a lot because poverty has runs the risk of poor nutrition and then just everyday constant um, stress put on to the child. And so that's why they think it kind of is involved in that. And just like how I said with cancer treatments of um, using reversing epigenetics, they have they think this is this is somewhat the effect of antidepressants too. And so like the picture on the right shows you start you might start with a normal neuron brain cell on the left and then through this bad stimulus you change into the blue neuron that has MDD MDD and then if you go through antidepressants and you use those then it can actually reverse you back and put you into remission so that you're more like the normal neuron. And so that just shows that you can try and fight against these epigenetic marks. And so now I'm going to talk about the role in nutrition on epigenetics with epigenetics. And so the two mice on the right in the picture, they're actually 100% genetically identical but they look a lot different, obviously. The mouse on the right is brown, thin, healthy, but the mouse on the left is yellow, and it's also obese, it's more prone to diseases. And this just centers around this certain gene, this agouti gene. And when, uh, in the normal mouse, it is, the gene is methylated, it has those epigenetic marks on it, but the obese yellow mouse doesn't have any of those marks, it's not regulated and this causes the change in physical appearance and risk for dis dis poor disease. Um, and so they wanted to look at this and see if they could change. The, so they wanted to see if they could change what the offspring would look like in these, in a yellow obese mouse. And so they did a little experiment and they took a pregnant yellow obese mouse and they either fed it a normal diet or a diet rich in these methyl groups that can give, um, that make the epigenetic marks on the DNA. And when the pregnant mouse had a normal diet, almost all of the offspring looked just like her. Nothing changed, nothing happened really. But when the pregnant yellow mouse had a diet rich in these methyl groups, then most of her offspring actually looked normal. And so since she had an excess of these methyl groups, um, then those were able to go to the baby she was carrying and they were able to have a methylated agouti gene and aren't prone to disease and look normal. And so that shows that what your mother eats can really affect you when you're in the womb. And a more human example of this has actually been seen in this isolated Swedish village from the 1800s. And it looked at the nutrition of the grandparents and how that affected the grandchildren, the grandchildren and how long they lived. And so this village was isolated and so they had to grow all their own food for the winter. And if they didn't make, have enough food for the winter, then they either had, then they had a famine. If they had enough, then it was considered a feast. And so they looked at the grandchildren and, and, the grand, and if the grandparents had either a feast or a famine, it determined how likely or how much of an extra risk the grandchildren had of dying earlier. And so they looked at the grandfather and the grandmother when they were developing their, their, sex, their sex sales themselves for their children. And so the grandfathers they looked at just before puberty and grandmothers they looked at when they were in the womb. And so it is actually just the opposite for feast and famine for the grandmother and grandfather. If there was a feast when the grandfather was developing those cells, then the grandsons were more likely to die er earlier such as from diseases such as obesity or diabetes. And if they had a famine just before puberty, they actually showed average risk. Nothing was different there. But in the grandmothers, then it switched in that when there was a feast when she was in the womb, she showed average risk, but then if there was a famine, then her granddaughters seemed more likely to die earlier. And so that also just shows the epigenetic inheritance I was talking about earlier and how 
your past generations can affect you now and shows the, that diet and role of nutrition can play a big role in how long you live and the effects that epigenetics can have on that. And so with that, we're going to transition into experimental biology with John. Okay, so mic check. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Is this working? Cool. Okay, so now I'm going to talk, or we're going to discuss the, how the topic of epigenetics has been incorporated into experimental biology. So to begin with, we need to understand the process of X inactivation. So we know that males have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, while females are born with two X chromosomes. And to prevent the expression of genes from both X chromosomes and females, one X chromosome must be inactivated through this process. And how it works is that there are four genes. Uh, you can see them here. And they code for non-coding RNA, meaning the RNA is not used to make proteins, but rather the RNA in this case is used to coat and inactivate one of the X chromosomes. The X chromosome meant to be inactivated. And we can illustrate this process by looking at calico cats. Here we can see their regions of black fur and regions of orange fur. And in regions of black fur, one X chromosome is inactivated, while in regions of orange fur, the other X chromosome is inactivated. So knowing that the body has a natural process to inactivate the extra X chromosome in cells of uh, females, uh, we can also take a look at uh, disorders where people are born with extra chromosomes and, and see uh, if there's a way to inactivate those chromosomes. So one such disorder is trisomy 21, and that's a condition where an individual is born with three chromosome 21s, or three 21st chromosomes instead of the normal two. As Tyler explained earlier, each human has 23 pairs of chromosomes. So this condition is important because it's a major cause of Down syndrome, and Down syndrome is a condition that affects a lot of individuals in the United States. Most of you might know someone with Down syndrome, or at least you see them in passing. In fact, one in 600 uh, people born in the United States are born with Down syndrome currently, and one in 300 uh, have an extra chromosome in a different type of disorder. So now what researchers are doing is that they're looking at the process of inactivating the X chromosome in females, in female body cells where there are two X chromosomes, and they're seeing if they could use that process to inactivate the extra chromosome in disorders such as trisomy 21. And how they're doing this, how researchers are trying to do this at least, is they're looking at one of the genes, the exist gene, which codes for, codes for that non-coding RNA, and they're using that to uh, create non-coding RNA to coat the extra chromosome in trisomy 21 and inactivate it to form a bar body, which Tyler mentioned earlier, which is a region of tightly packed, dense uh, chromatin, and in this case, it's a chromosome that's inactivated. And this has already been successful in in vitro experiments, meaning with cell cultures uh, or cells of individuals with trisomy 21. But as far as inactivating all of the extra chromosomes in an individual with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, that's yet to happen. It's unclear if that will happen. But this is definitely something to look out for in the future. So now that we've talked about X inactivation and trisomy 21, Another topic of epigenetics that, says, that has recently been in the news is in vitro fertilization. Now, for those of you who don't know, in vitro fertilization is basically the process of fertilizing a woman's egg outside of her body, in a, basically in a cell culture. And so the sperm cell fertilizes the egg, and then for two to six days, uh, the, egg, the fertilized egg grows outside the body until it's implanted back into the female uterus, where then it is conceived or not conceived, born, I mean. But basically, what uh, this recent article in 2017, I know it's a little blurry, but in 2017, uh, we found that scientists are looking to add amniotic fluid to the cell culture. And this has to do with epigenetics, and I'm about to explain why. So we know, or scientists have found out, that babies born through in vitro fertilization have epigenetic 
differences in their epigenetic makeup compared to babies that are con conceived normally. And we also know that babies born through in vitro fertilization have a greater propensity for adverse health conditions or birth defects compared to babies conceived normally as well. So the question becomes, and what scientists are looking at is, could these adverse health conditions and birth defects be happening because of the differences in epigenetic makeup? And what can we do to resolve that? So using this theory, scientists are adding the amniotic fluid to the cell culture where the fertilized egg grows during in vitro fertilization because the amniotic fluid contains certain uh, epigenetic markers, which are basically those DNA methylation sites that Tyler and Lauren have been referring to. So those epigenetic markers are closely associated with good health. And by adding this, the, the amniotic fluid to the uh, fertilized egg during in vitro fertilization, uh, they're passing on those epigenetic markers to the baby to create a pre-embryonic environment that is similar to a baby conceived normally. So early human trials are promising as far as passing on those epigenetic markers to the baby, but as far as the baby uh, leading a more healthy life or having less adverse health conditions and birth defects, it remains it's too early to be seen because this study was done in 2017, at least this article, but it seems promising so far. Okay, so in the realm of experimental biology, we've discussed X inactivation and then in vitro fertilization. So now we're going to discuss how 3D chromatin structure impacts DNA interactions and uh, in doing so, gene expression. So this might seem a little bit complicated, but really what we're trying to show here is that in the structure of chromatin, there, there are areas which are looped and then there are areas that are more straight like this. So in areas that are looped, there are higher levels of interaction between different parts, of the, different parts of the DNA within the chromatin. And in areas that are straight, there are less interactions. And to review, chromatin is basically the structure uh, that chromosomes are composed of. It's made, of, made up of DNA wrapped around histones, which are a type of protein. Uh, and so now that we know that, in these areas where the chromatin is looped, there are higher interactions uh, between different parts of the DNA, like I said, which uh, we can see in this image here. The larger triangles basically represent interactions between different parts of the, of the DNA within the chromatin. And so especially in the part where the loop converges, uh, we would find more interactions and therefore different gene expression in these areas. So the question becomes, can we change what areas of the chromatin are looped and what areas of the chromatin are straight? can we change the 3D structure of chromatin and, and in doing so change the interactions of the DNA in different areas of the chromatin? Well, in Drosophila, uh, which are basically fruit flies, we know that there are eight architectural proteins which are responsible for the site of these uh, loop, looping structures within the chromatin. And current research is being done to see how we can shift these eight uh, architectural proteins to change the chromatin structure therefore change DNA interactions and change DNA expression. Humans don't have architectural proteins, but they have a similar boundary element. So research is being done with Drosophila because a lot of the research being done probably wouldn't be good to do on humans. So, so I'm actually working in a lab that is looking at this right now. I work in Dr. Carmen's lab right here at the University of Iowa in the biology building. And what we're doing is we're heat shocking Drosophila or those fruit flies or exposing them to high temperature stress and we're seeing how this impacts, how this redistributes those architectural proteins within the chromatin, changes, changes where these loops are located, changes where these architectural proteins are located, and then therefore changes the interactions between different parts of the DNA. And we can see this in this image. Uh, it seems complicated, but basically these triangles are, represent areas of interaction between different parts of the DNA within the chromatin. Pardon me. And after the temperature stress, we see that these interactions change. And uh, so we see that the DNA interactions change between different parts of the chromatin as the architectural proteins are relocated. Therefore, gene expression changes as well. So this is a study uh, done by Cubanus, Plotz, and Cor Corsez. And in my lab, we're trying to replicate a similar study to make sure that what we're seeing with this heat shock, temperature stress, changes indeed the 3D chromatin structure. But what we also know is that oxidative stress and aging can uh, do a similar effect, uh, resulting in shifts of the 
these regions of chromatin loops and regions where chromatin is straight. Oxidative stress is basically just a toxic environment, meaning chemicals, things like that. And aging is what we're about to get into. So that finishes my section on epigenetics and experimental biology. And then now we're going to discuss epigenetics and aging, as you can see. OK, so the preeminent topic that comes up whenever uh, epigenetics and aging are discussed is most probably the epigenetic clock, which Tyler mentioned briefly earlier. And it's not meant to be a complicated thing. Basically, there are 353 markers, epigenetic markers, where DNA methylation can occur, meaning that a uh, thing can stick onto the DNA and turn off the gene expression or turn off the gene. So, and based on the levels of your methylation at these 353 markers, uh, scientists are able to predict the biological age, which is different from your chronological age, because there is a certain, uh, there's an association between a certain levels of methylation with a chronological age, and based on the difference, scientists, scientists can predict a biological age. And what the epigenetic clock means is basically the rate of acceleration of your biological age, so how much is changing. And your biological age can be changed with a multi multitude of factors that can be sped up or slowed down. And so what decelerates the biological age are bad things like bad lifestyle choices, poor diet, diseases, stress, uh, certain other risk factors like gender. And then what speeds up, or I'm sorry, what decelerates your biological age, what slows down your aging process, are healthy lifestyle choices like diet and exercise. So. So in case you didn't quite grasp that, a fun way to illustrate this is with our very own Dr. McAllister, who was voted the most changed individual at his 30th, <laughs> at his 30th high school reunion, while this other lady, Amy Rowe, from his uh, graduating class, was voted the least changed. And the interesting thing is that these two were born on the exact same day, and they graduated from the exact same high school in the same graduating class. And the reason why McAllister might have been voted the most changed while Amy Rowe might have been voted the, most, the least changed is because of this, their differences in their biological age from the methylation levels within their genome. So I don't know. It could have been all the stress from studying so hard for <laughs> McAllister. Who knows? <laughs> OK, so now that we know that biological age is a thing, the question becomes, why is it important? Why should I care? If my biological age is higher than my chronological age, is that necessarily a bad thing? And the answer, it seems, is that yes, biological age is a good determining factor for both mortality and health. And so this statistic you can read here basically says that a one-year difference between your biological age and your chronological age raises your chance of death or your mortality by 2 to 4%. Now, that doesn't seem like much, but to put that into perspective, if a person has a biological age of, say, 50 and a chronological age of, say, 40, that 10-year difference means a 20 to 40 percent higher risk of death, of mortality, according to this study of 13,000 people. So definitely, it's something significant there. And then to see how biological age is related with health, there have been studies on that as well. Uh, we can see here that among non-smokers, former smokers, and smokers alike, uh, they have a greater risk of lung cancer based on the rate of increase of the biological age, which IEAA, that's basically what it means. And then also among, as your age increases, the rate of, as your actual age increases, the uh, rate of increase of, of your biological age also increases, and you're also at a greater risk for lung cancer. So we see that biological age has been closely associated with both your mortality and your health. So. OK, so now that we know biological age is important, it exists, the question becomes, can we reverse aging? Can we change your biological age to be lower? And research being done on this topic utilizes induced human stem cells, which you can see here in this image. And induced human stem cells are basically, the way they're made is that any body cell is uh, introduced to certain transcription factors, and then they're converted into stem cells. And these stem cells can differentiate into basically any type of other body cell, uh, like muscle cells, neurons, skin cells, things that Tyler mentioned earlier. And I want to make clear that uh, these induced human stem cells uh, that were 
discussing in this research, it's completely different from the stem cells used at stem cell clinics or stem cell therapy options that might be available currently, such as, because uh, they use adult stem cells from the bone marrow or stem cells attained from the um, umbilical cord blood. And that stem cell therapy, the safety and the effectiveness of that therapy is still under question because it can lead to tumors and it's still unclear if it can uh, exactly aid or mitigate health conditions. So I just want to make clear that what I'm discussing here is completely separate from what we can see at stem cell clinics or options available currently. Uh, these, you can't get any treatment with these as of yet. This is in early stages, just research at this point. So regardless, what researchers are doing uh, in this study from 2015, a team of Japanese researchers, what they did is that they introduced these uh, induced human stem cells to connective tissue cells, which are called fibroblasts. And they found that the int introduction of the induced stem cells removed uh, certain age-related respiratory defects in the connective tissue cells because, and the reason being, or that the reason that they posit is because the induced stem cells lack certain epigenetic markers that uh, st cells gain as they age. So, but this is just, again, this is in research stages. No treatment has been done using stem cells for reversing aging or removing epigenetic markers, but it's something to look out for in the future and a, dire a direction that scientists are heading, so. So, pardon me. So reversing aging is not quite accessible for the population right now. I guess the question becomes, can we slow down our aging? Uh, we saw earlier that diet and exercise are a good way to slow down your biological aging, but there are other ways as well. So what this study did is that they uh, used mice and they exposed them or gave them three different treatments. So a normal mouse would follow this dotted line here where its epigenetic age or its biological age is the exact same as its biological age. And in the mice in this study, there was a black, the black line represents the untreated mice and the green line represents the treated mice. So the untreated mice, their biological age increase was slightly lower than their uh, chronological age increase. So they had a slightly healthier environment. But the mice that were treated with these three different treatments, their biological age increase was much lower than their uh, chronological age. And these treatments, uh, one was a, it was a genetic mutation, which I won't get into because it's sort of out of the scope of what we're discussing here. But one was that caloric uh, restriction, which goes into that diet, which we mentioned earlier. It's a way of uh, decelerating your ex epigenetic clock and slowing down the rate of increase of your, of your biological age. And the other was a chemical actually called uh, rapamycin. So this is important and the reason why this is intriguing is because possibly drugs or therapies can be created using chemicals like rapamycin to possibly slow down your biological aging process uh, such as we found in these mice here. Uh, currently there are no drugs or anything available but this looks like it could be something to come out in the future where uh, drugs are sold uh, to decrease the rate of increase of your biological age. So. But as of right now, no one wants to really do it, but the best options you have are diet and exercise, so. Okay, so there is a group out there, a team of uh, researchers who have proposed a biological aging kit that claims to map out those 353 epigenetic markers and determine your biological age. And so I'm not endorsing this group by any means. Uh, it's called My DNA Age. And we can watch a video uh, of them basically proposing how their kit works and what it can offer. Give me one second. Biochemical 
level. Since 1994, Zymo Research has been creating the tools and services used by researchers to translate and decipher the secrets hidden within our genomes. Factors such as the environment, aging, stress, diet, and exercise all have a direct impact on those epigenetic biochemical marks on our DNA. So if you think about it, epigenetics is really a mechanism through which our own past experience or life history is directly written into our DNA, the very fabric of the material or the blueprint that makes us who we are. Epigenetics plays a key role in many diseases, including cancers, diabetes, autism, and PTSD. Recent findings from Professor Steve Horvath of UCLA show that epigenetics also influence how we age. We've now entered a beyond Darwin era where we know our environment and lifestyle choices can directly impact our DNA through the mechanism of epigenetics. These choices can influence all aspects of our lives from our embryonic development to how fast we age. Simo Research is at the forefront of this post-Darwin era offering services and products to help you understand your epigenetics. Our epigenetic aging clock service allows you to determine your true biological age and compare it to your chronological age. People will now be able to see if environment and lifestyle changes have negative or positive effects on their aging process. We invite you to explore epigenetics with us. Imagine what we can discover together. Okay, so just to be clear, uh, I'm not endorsing my DNA age or their product, but basically what they offer is a $300 kit <laughs> to determine your biological age uh, using the epigenetic clock or those 353 markers. But it is an option on the market today as the topic of, of, as the topic of epigenetics is becoming more and more in the forefront in research and uh, biological science. Uh, also, I don't know if I agree with his whole post-Darwin era <laughs> ideas, but uh, his, the words in that, present, uh, in that video concerning epigenetics, epigenetics were mostly accurate. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up our presentation. Uh, thanks for listening, uh, and are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Microphone that I'll want you to ask your questions in the microphone so that we can get them recorded. Um, I think that the idea is for the three of you to sit at this table um, uh, to answer those questions. So, does anybody have any questions? Yes. I just have a question from that last slide that had something on aging and telomere, telomere shortening. Oh, yeah. Because I've read some studies. I have a couple of preemies, and they say when preemies are born, they found that they have shortened telomeres. I don't know if that's true or not, but then they would be babies, so I don't know how that would correlate with aging. So why don't, why don't you guys first talk about it, just uh, give a brief overview of what tel telomeres are and sort of uh, there is actually sort of a, a test available in terms of TLO years test as well. So okay. anybody okay. want to take that on? Uh, I would definitely defer this to Tyler. <laughs> okay. So uh, based on my understanding, uh, telomeres are the things that, so our DNA is packaged into 23 chromosomes and then on the chromosomes, uh, the ends of the chromosomes, at the tips, those things are called telomeres. They're just uh, sections of uh, DNA or something which get smaller as you age, which uh, gets smaller as you age. And then, um, yeah, so, so that's a problem. And then I, I suppose there's a test which, uh, which looks at that. So, uh, so as he said, the, the DNA is a sequence, well, the chromosomes are a sequence of DNA, and there are special sequences at the end of chromosomes and there's a unique process that leads to the extension of those little sequences of DNA at the ends of chromosomes that we call telomeres. Um, as you age, those telomeres do shorten, um, and there are studies out there that have looked at uh, the relationship uh, between telomere shortening and 
sort of uh, the aging process and so diseases associated with, with the advanced age and, and finding that shortened telomeres relates to uh, uh, incidence of cancer, uh, other health effects. I don't know anything in relation to telomeres and preemies and why that's it. Um, uh, and why you would why you would see anything specific there, um, uh, but but telomeres are similar to sort of the epigenetic marks, uh, this this DNA change uh, that's associated with uh, health conditions in general, uh, and there is a direct to consumer marketed test called the Telo Years test uh, that uh, will give you your um, your telo age, <laughs> and so they make an interpretation of sort of how long your telomeres are um, in terms of a telo, telo year estimate. Um, uh, my concern with that is that it's doing it on a saliva sample, and how does that relate to other cells in my body uh, that potentially are more important than the cells that come out of my saliva and I send to the company to assess. Um, and so that I would, I would uh, treat that with a little bit of a grain of salt in terms of its u utility. Other questions? Anybody else have any other questions? How far along is, is the research on um, removing uh, the extra chromosome for 21 for Down syndrome in um, fetus? Uh, yeah, so research done so far has only been successful in vitro, uh, meaning just with cell cultures. So like a cells of individuals with Down syndrome or trisomy 21, excuse me. And in those uh, trials or those experiments, we found that those, uh, the extra chromosome has been inactivated and formed into a bar body. But as far as, uh, you know, humans inactivating the extra uh, chromosome 21, uh, we're not quite there. And it's unclear if we'll get there. But. Can, can you imagine some of the hurdles that yeah. have, would have to be sort of overcome before you could say, diagnose and treat an individual right. um, with trisomy 21? Yeah. It, Can you identify some of those, oh, some you of those limitations actually, and hurdles? Oh, yeah. So there's, it's definitely uh, like introducing, using the exist gene to inactivate the extra chromosome in every cell in the human body would just be almost an impossible task. But as, as far as something realistic, uh, maybe topically, although I don't know how useful that would be, but in like certain areas of the body, possibly. Uh, this could be something to look for in the future. So I can imagine it'd be very, very challenging. And so working on in cell culture is very different than, say, diagnosing um, a conception that uh, has trisomy 21. So first you have to diagnose that. And that's not something that is heritable within the family. It's just an instance of uh, the formation of that egg or that sperm the, the genetic mistake happens that leads to that extra copy of chromosome 21. And so once the, once the embryo is already developing and multicellular, you can diagnose the presence of the extra tw uh, 21st chromosome. And by that point, you have many cells that you have to deal with and that you would have to uh, shut down that extra chromosome 21. And so it become a very difficult problem, sort of, um, you know, wh whenever you're talking about, say, uh, two, three months in, into development. Um, uh, there are technologies coming out that can, um, that can uh, uh, identify a conception earlier uh, during development that does have abnormal chromosome numbers, such as uh, trisomy 21. And so the earlier that those can be identified, uh, the more likely any intervention uh, could actually play a role. So those, those, that'll be a big hurdle in terms of uh, developing a treatment such as that. Um, so. so this 
process when you talk about inactivating the chromosome 21, is it something that it's possible to target only to the chromosome 21 or on trying to inactivate the 21, there is a risk of having inactivating another chromosome, not only the 21? You know what I mean, like an off target? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about this, but I imagine uh, the selection of the gene had something to do with it, the exist gene, instead of all four genes or uh, uh, a different combination of the genes used to make the non-coding RNA. But also, I believe it has to do with the irregularity uh, of the, there being three chromosomes in that 21st chromosome in the trisomy 21. Uh, and that could also play a factor into why you know, normal chromosomes aren't inactivated. So. Anyone else have a question? Well, uh, I saw the hand. Do you want to ask it? <laughs> just about the, well, I, I figure I just, I figure I missed something about the isolated Swedish village. It looked like the um, descendants were of the same sex. And I just wondered if those stressors affected both sexes or just the, the same sex of the, parent, of the grandparents? Um, in the article, they just had the grandfather affecting the grandson and the grandmother affecting the granddaughters. That's just what the study looked at. <clears throat> Not sure why, but. <laughs> Okay, so no more questions. Well, let's thank our um, presenters again for their presentation.